The talk today comes out of a, um, a book which I'm finishing, just putting the, the, doing the final revisions. Um, oddly timed for the REF deadline. I don't know how that happened. Um, and um, ironically, uh, weirdly, um, the title of the book changed while I was on the train on the way up here. Um, because the publisher said that the marketing department had vetoed the title we've been working to for. So um, it was Making Connections, New Media Development and Globalization. New Media Development and Globalization stays the same. It's probably going to be called something like Developing Dialogues now, which is actually not a bad title. I'm, I'm not unhappy with it. But. The, um, the bits that, uh, as I'm, fini I'm um, finishing for um, <coughs> publication, so it's quite nice to have the chance to take some of the ideas out for one last kind of test drive before we go into production. Um, and the stuff that I thought I'd talk from is a couple of chapters which are specifically about the new media bit, um, new media and development. Um, the book comes out of a, um, a whole range of studies I've been doing with a, all kinds of collaborators for. Um, quite a few years, um, started in, in late 90s and kind of worked its way through a few kind of nice places I got funded to go to um, until about 2005 when the series on hiatus um, ran out of money. <coughs> um, people got tired of me or something. Um, and then a lot of life got in the way, so the book's only getting done now. Um, one of the things that um, has interested me throughout this kind of run of, of projects, they're all um, in one way or another, um, there were attempts to get funding for um, ethnographies of new media use in various non-northern places. That really is all that strings it all together. <coughs> um, and to kind of get at some of the diversity of ways in which new communicative possibilities, machines, resources, skills, and so on, are enlisted by, enlisted by people in the way in which they think about their futures, things, their development, literally, livelihood strategies, their relation to the rest of the world, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the kind of run of projects um, started to involve organizations like UNESCO and DFID and so on, and um, therefore took a more and more developmental cast as it went along. Um, that's to say, more and more of the money came in the form of being asked to find out what is the impact of new media on development? What do these machines do and can we justify the kinds of expenditures? Um, uh, and can we cost account the activities of these kinds of agents, you know, the, these agencies involved in some of these areas? So one of the questions, and it, a lot of it goes back to Andrew Barry's notion of technological zones really, is um, that, that intrigued me all the way through is, is to put it very crudely, um, what role does the very notion of media and new media play in getting me this money? That's to say, why is it that a term like media or new media um, plays such an incredibly strong, powerful organizing role um, in um, organizing various kinds of development initiatives and organizing um, the operation of large segments of organizations like um, UNESCO or DFID, what, what, you know, what, what role did the actual term play? So in a sense, the kind of um, take on the relationship between new media and politics that I, I want to explore here um, is really around the idea of, of what, what political function, what role the actual notion of media and new media was playing, what kinds of politics um, unfolded from different uses of the term media. And I wanted to start, as ethnographers tend to do, with a story. I'll tell another story in a little while. Um, this is from um, a project, um, most of this happened around 2003 to 2005, 6, um, in Ghana. Um, this is funded by um, DFID. And again, they were interested in. Um, well, as the, guy, the different guy in, in Accra said to me, um, we spend an awful lot of, we throw, how do you put, we throw an awful lot of money at new media, um, but we have no idea you know, what the hell that does. Um, I don't usually talk to researchers, but I'll talk to you, okay? It's a sense of, again, what, 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 what do media, we have an awful lot of um, 
his activity was increasingly organized around ideas of media and new media, particularly at that period, or, you know, the first half of the noughties. Um, but with very little sense of, of, of what it did, other than organizing a lot of different activity. Um, the, we had one field site in um, Accra. We had another field site in a rural area, um, which I codenamed uh, or pseudonymized as Corapo, which was in kind of um, southwest Ghana. Um, and in the district capital, of of the of Carapa, of the district um, was a media center which looked like that and was usually about as empty as that not an uncommon site in development projects um, occasionally there were three guys from the local bank who were sent there to learn excel okay um, other than that what we tended to get um, and the, the idea behind it was um, bussing in um, school classes um, from outlying villages. Um, they normally came to kind of um, worship these machines, basically to sit there and look at them um, once a year. And that was about, about the extent of it. I I mean, the, the heterogeneous engineering obviously gives the, my game away. I'm thinking a lot of ANT here. <laughs> what kind of connections and what kinds of networks are actually being assembled through these objects? Um, this doesn't look like a very promising or well-populated one at the moment. Um, and I think one of the reasons is the, the kind of notion of media, or one of the things that one can look at is the kind of notion of media that was being operated here. Um, it's one that didn't connect. Um, the way I put it here, I mean, no one actually said this, but this, this is kind of what the center said to people. Um, and I put uh, certain words in, in um, scare quotes um, along the lines of, of kind of, these are the terms which seem particularly black boxed, okay? Um, the idea of the, com the computer center idea of the medium, uh, the internet or the computers, I mean, it actually was a, Computer center with an extremely good internet connection for the time, certainly for that area. If you come to the computer center, this place, you come to this place, it's there, that's where the medium is. Um, you can access something called a computer. We all know what it is and what its properties are, and you can come here and get computer literacy courses, which, as it were, you know, present those properties to you, and then you can become um, connected to it. Um, you can use the internet, and you can get information and take it home with you. So there are all <coughs> kinds of entities here which are kind of presumed. Um, the center itself came, was funded through um, HIPIC money at the time. It was debt cancellation money. Um, it came, it was funded by, or the program was put together by a very I would say charismatic and very um, proactive um, chief executive officer of the local um, of that district, Carapo, um, who was able to <coughs> capture some of that money, um, and um, that center actually became the kind of um, flagship for spending most of Ghana, the rest of Ghana's debt cancellation money, which was to have similar centers defined in similar ways in every district capital around Ghana. Um, one of the things I really wanted to um, emphasize in this kind of story is that um, the use of the term media here, new media, again all that black boxing around computer centers, computers, and all the rest of it, um, played a very starkly exclusionary role. It was about setting certain kinds of divisions in the social field. Um, which I would say eventuates in that kind of empty room and a certain relationship between um, these school classes and these, these machines. I could tell lots of stories, but just to summarize, um, one thing that was very, very clear was that those notions of computer and internet, the vision of that center, um, was entirely framed in terms of relation to global discourses on new media. Um, there are ways of, you know, as we know, there are ways of filling in forms. Um, of using a certain language of new media in order to get this money in the first place. 
um, everything that was being said in and around this um, uh, that center related to then you know absolutely predominant languages about new information societies, emerging network society, all the rest of it. A lot of them, uh, not that that's the chief executive also, but a lot of others, they'd all read their castells. Okay? Um, so they knew how to fill in the forms and to, you know, uh, and to make the connections not to the schools, but to castells. Okay? Um, and to people in Brussels and Paris who spoke the same kind of language. Um, one of the um, effects of this, um, which I constantly was, was observing in the place, was that the use of that language of new media and the black boxing of those kinds of objects in those ways um, not only didn't connect very effectively in a kind of you know, common sense way to these schools um, and classes and so on, um, it also treated the actual area, Carapo, as effectively not having any media. Okay. The media that were recognized, that were given the social status of media, um, had to fit um, you know, certain obvious stereotypes of what the computer is, internet, and so on. Um, and that in itself connected, I say, in a, to a kind of Castellian world. You know, the, the things that matter, the matters of concern, are the objects that connect to this vision of network society. Um, there was almost no connection to anything that was going on in the area, which was seen as, again, empty space in communicative terms. Now, it actually was a space that was filled with, you know, when you actually went to the villages, there were um, video and DVD um, cinemas, you know, run by um, um, petrol engines, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, there was an enormous amount of talk about media, particularly because um, the villages were all gradually being electrified. So in an almost purely McLuhanist way, people were talking about light um, and electricity as a form of medium, you know, different kinds of sociality which could be brought into being through different kinds of machines. It just didn't happen to be the ones that were sitting in that kind of office. And another kind of, um, you know, clear kind of media um, <coughs> were, the, were things like roads and buses and the movement of people and so on. There was an awful lot of talk about all kinds of connect connectivity which was not visible from that space. Um, the most insult I mean, it's actually stuck really still with me. Um, doing an interview with a, um, a woman who was the chief officer of the educational department for the entire district, basically sat me down in her office with my Ghanaian research partner um, with a computer on her desk covered in plastic, as these things often are, you know, never used, just it's a you know, symbolic object. Um, and sat there for the first half hour of the interview just telling me hysterically funny jokes about how stupid the villagers were um, and how, you know, how can you possibly, um, you know, get them to make any sense of a computer when they're spending most of their time scrabbling around in mud, okay? This was just told as a, you know, as a, just the clear sense of disconnect of, you know, this is blank space where nothing of any concern happens, actually a waste of space versus um, the pristine but unused computer center, which she stood for. Um, there are other things, I mean, without going into uh, great detail, but there are all kinds of exclusions. A lot of this was happening in the run-up to um, the World Summit of the Information Society, WISIS, um, and one of the most clear disconnects <coughs> that was going on here was between, um, basically, the, in connecting that computer center to notions of new media, they also disconnected the idea of media from older media. So, for example, there was an entire generation of community radio activists who were not invited to WISIS or any of the pre preliminary meetings. Okay, Again, new media and that sense of what a medium is was a clear political dividing line in the sand um, between different political generations, between different political styles. And if I have time, I can go into just the what radio meant as opposed to internet. It was an immensely <coughs> popular um, medium, um, which possibly for those re you know, for that very reason might have been seen as a bit threatening. But it certainly didn't connect again to a Castellian future. It's old media. Okay. Lots of this kind of stuff going on. And again, I mean, I referenced <coughs> Andrew Barry's a, a minute ago, technological zones. Again, you know, there's just a very clear sense here in which. Um, the, 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 the extension of the political, the definition, the formation of the political, the kind of making of that region um, was as much done through the technology as the technology itself 
was somehow inflected by political, different kinds of political logics. Um, just a couple of pictures. This is actually Carapo um, Market on the side there. Um, not a great picture, but it you know, gives me a sense of a West African district capital. Um, again, lots of you know, people are uh, Trotro, it's a bus. Um, and that's the village that um, the Trotro connects to. Um, this was one of our most outlying villages, about 45 minutes from the district capital um, if there wasn't too much mud. When I, uh, one thing I want to do is, try, is contrast that kind of, um, the, what connections are being made through that computer center, what work the term media was doing there, and what kind of political formation was emerging. With um, this is a quote from um, this is a, I have to say a bit of a composite quote. It's not one quote. It's putting together a kind of story which was being repeated endlessly. Um, almost all women in West Africa, certainly in Ghana, are traders of one sort or another, often trading at considerable distance with very very complex kind of um, connections that have to be coordinated. Um, Sarah, um, as a, a kind of composite trader, um, is um, describing here um, how she might use these buses, roads, market days, and all the rest of it to build up a kind of um, what I would call a communicative assemblage. Um, she wouldn't call it a medium. I wouldn't call it a medium. But a reliable set of connections. I send younger son by Trotro, that's the red bus, to Karapo, the district capital, with cassava and messages. He gives the messages face to face to elder son in the school and phones my elder sister in Accra to arrange delivery of perfumes by next truck. There were really complicated contractual arrangements that would often happen between third, fourth, and fifth parties with people trading in, in complex chains that she might, someone like her, might manage. Um, and to find out if elder brother from London is coming home for Christmas, younger son is to return with soap, charcoal, and the daughter of my third cousin once removed. It's classic A and T stuff in some ways. Okay, it's the kind of, you know, look at the heterogeneous, you know, the range of of stuff, people, movements, connections, and so on that are being made. Um, this is not a tabula rasa. This is a complex field of, of connection, um, in which someone like this is not just making up a kind of um, set of connections, but is reliably, skillfully, and routinely. This is something that someone like this would do every day or every market day. Um, one of the things we played around with on this project is what I like to call um, communicative algorithms. Not a, pl not a pretty phrase, but um, ways of kind of capturing the kinds of connections. Um, there's the impoverished um, uh, computer center, just access to computers. That's, the, that's a communicative system here. We will let you into the building and you can connect. Um, there's the kind of SARA algorithm, much more complicated extensive, again, orchestration of a range of different kinds of connections. Um, and then the bottom one um, was um, the result of one quite <coughs> late night conversation with the guy who was running the computer center. We tried to kind of say, what would the computer center look like if we applied Sarah's logic to it, rather than the logic that um, had been applied previously which turned into a long story about um, the ways in which um, <coughs> rather than seeing computer center, he could see that space as, I mean, fairly clearly, an information processing place in which he could make use, much like Sarah does, of a whole range of connections in order to make information flow. Um, so the way we actually described it was rather than talk about, this is not about media, it's not about these black, dot, black, black box objects and the worlds which they connect to and make, through which they make sense of and the kinds of um, bureaucratic apparatuses they're supposed to be part of. Um, rather than talk about media, talk about something like a communicative assemblage in the way that might, one might talk about Sarah's operations. Um, it's a bit of a long story, but what it amounted to was that um, there were teachers in the, <coughs> for example, in that village, the remote village I've showed the picture of, um, who are going to Carapo, just like Sarah's you know, son, and so on, very regularly. Um, 
they had no um, <coughs> you know, books or paper or any kind of material for the school and so on. Um, rather than bring the kids to the, you know, for, not rocket science, rather than bring the kids to the school um, to look at, the, look at a computer, um, let's just think about the kinds of information that could be made to flow largely by photocopying bits of source information up and down that road. The terminology that came out of that project um, and the, the sequence of projects was, again, to get away from the term media entirely, to drop it um, as a research strategy, um, let alone new media. Um, and rather, talk, rather than talking about the objects, um, talk about the that process of assemblage and the way in which one could, um, again, in a fairly classic A&T way, um, open the black boxes, which have been closed bureaucratically and politically and so on, um, <laughs> and think instead about simply the ensemble of symbolic and material resources for communication in a place. What does Sarah have to work with, for example? What does the teacher have to work with? Um, and the social networks through which they might be organized and mediated. In some ways, very classic ethnography anyway. Um, instead of starting from privileged classifications like media, let's start from looking at what people in a particular place or community or whatever um, classify as tools for communication, as acts of communication, as forms of connection, relationship information, and so on and so forth. Can we actually throw open the whole set of questions? <coughs> so that marks out one kind of strategy. Um, and opens up a, 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 a variety of ways of um, questioning um, what terms like media do, what alternative ways of classifying what we find and what we can evoke in a particular area might do, um, and the different kinds of ways of observing and doing politics. One of the obvious issues here for me as a researcher was simply thinking back to these days was um, were there analytical and research strategies by which I could distance myself from that older question of what are the impacts of media, which would take for granted my place in accepting um, the extension of a technological zone around particular notions of communicative objects. So that's one bit of the argument that I want to uh, trot out. Um, but there was another bit of the argument, um, which I want to do through, which I want to kind of bring out through um, a few other stories from the same research, um, which I think bring out some of the limitations of ANT approaches here, um, and uh, limitations of this assemblage. How far can you go with these things? Um, And which I, I suppose the way of putting it is bring out um, other kinds of political issues and other ways in which politics is done in and through um, different kinds of um, communicative assemblages. One way of ca <coughs> characterizing um, what I was doing up till now in that first story, um, Latour um, talks about, certainly in earlier work like visualization and cognition, describes this as a strategy of deflation. Um, and he's got that wonderfully kind of homespun way of talking of, can we bring the great abstractions of networks, in my case, he didn't, or didn't then talk about network society or information society or whatever, can we deflate it? Can we have a strategy of deflation which brings it back down to the nuts and bolts of actually connecting up people and things and skills and so on and so forth? Um, can we, in a sense, see the materialization and work our way to the abstraction <coughs> through that. And obviously a notion like communicative assemblage is, is kind of within that sort of tradition. Um, please don't talk to me about network society. Please leave your crystals home. Just tell me, what are people doing? Okay, what if, how are people connect? Can we deflate um, d back to the nuts and bolts? Can we get back to Sarah, basically? Um, or can we see the computer center, um, the way we might also describe um, Sarah's operations? The problem here, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll introduce it really abstractly, and then I'll, I'll as I say, give, give uh, an example, uh, tell a story about it. Um, 
the problem here is that if I stick to these very, very basic kind of algorithms and very basic assemblages, that kind of works. If I was trying to put together, um, um, as it were, the whole um, fieldwork experience, it doesn't. Okay, or at least it leaves out something um, which I think is absolutely major. Um, further down the, 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 in the middle of the slide, I mean, there are various kinds of words that I've played around with for a long time. You might tell me later what you like um, to, to try to get at it. But the idea of, meet, of modalities, cultural forms, culture is coming back in here, cultural forms, some sense of pattern um, that people see. Um, Bordurian structures of dispositions, perhaps. Um, there's a whole lot of language. I also go, when, go back to Raymond Williams, the idea of structures of feeling. Um, I learned a lot from uh, Ryle's work, where she draws on Bateson and Strathern, the idea of informational aesthetics, for example, in her work, ne Network Inside Out. The network is not just an assemblage. It's not just the way people put things together. It's an aesthetic form <coughs> that people a pattern that people can detect um, in different ways of organizing, but also acts as an injunction, almost an ideal type, a way of seeing um, what a social field should look like and patterning it. And it's not, it's, it, it's not reducible to simply the mechanical connection of things. Um, it can actually be a kind of plan to which people connect things, rather old sort of notion. Um, one of the things that I want to point to in that is um, if the metaphor that Latour constantly returns to and A&T constantly returns to is the engineer. You know, the, the, um, in a sense, the, this other story, which I want to tell, is about um, the communicator as a poet, a maker of metaphors, someone who can make flying leaps between incredibly disparate parts of the world. Um, and make rather strange connections, which might not be visible to that kind of you know, mechanical engineering metaphor. Um, and it's also, um, if you put all that together, it's something that brings me rather closer to uh, material culture studies than it does to actor network theory. That's to say, in what ways can we, even having learned the lessons of AMT, can we continue to talk about something Again, values or in, <coughs> forms of thought, patterns, again, all these different kinds of terms, um, which are not so reducible. The story is more, f in this case, um, or I'll tell it in the form of, uh, that I encountered it more in um, urban field sites in um, Accra than in the rural fields I've just been talking about. Most of the work there was done in a bit of northern Accra called Namobi, which was basically a, a kind of mixed um, Christian and Muslim area with a lot of kind of, um, it's, it's classified as a, I mean, the local language word for it would be a zongo. It's a slum with a lot of incoming northerners, a lot of, and a mix of, of Muslim, basically Muslim and Christian. Um, very, very poor, but with an absolutely, th at that time, thriving internet and mobile phone culture. Um, mobile phones in Ghana then were you know, like exploding, um, one of the fastest growth rates in Africa at the time, for all I know still. Um, and in terms of internet, um, this incredibly poor area, um, during the time we were working there, had ten packed internet cafes up and down the, the high street. Um, the story I want to tell, though, is about how that mobile phone use and internet use, um, though it looked, and the government loved to talk about this as, you know, the internet, uh, the um, a network revolution, information society emerging in Ghana, all this kind of stuff, you know, this is one uniform s space um, of digi digitalization and new media activity. Um, despite that kind of, that, that sense that, you know, of an explosion of, of digital objects or whatever, um, mobile phone use and internet use were diametrically opposite to each other. They actually bore almost no relation to each other. And in fact, you could treat them in many ways as inversions of each other. 
Um, I'll characterize that in a moment. The broader sense, which again, where I want to talk about something like mod mod modalities, is that to get at the, what, what, what these two different objects meant and why they were so different was not just about talking about how internet was assembled or how those, you know, how those um, cafes worked or any of that sort of stuff. It involved much broader um, kind of structures and patterns um, that people, through which people were seeing and enacting um, those kinds of objects. Um, this basically um, summarizes a kind of the, 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 the overall um, opposition between mobiles and internets as they emerged. Um, mobile phones um, are described in terms of an embedded modality, an embedded form. Um, they're all about how you manage existing relationships um, with a strong focus on something like how can you make existing relationships more virtual? Basically, and one of the you know one image to keep in mind there is simply um, it's a constant of everyday communication of fiction of everything in, in Ghana um, that um, kinship is crucial, social networks are crucial, life is about networking. Um, it's through networks that one gets certain kinds of resources and sustains forms of life, but networks, um, including kinship networks, are also sources of, of yeah, sort of <laughs> extreme and costly obligation. Are there ways of discharging those obligations as cheaply as possible? Okay, um, that's kind of what I mean by can you make um, actual relationships which precede the mediation more virtual, less costly? Can you make them? Um, again, the, the exemplary the exemplary case I would give um, if, if you, you know. The one I, I kind of crystallize it, the image I crystallize it with in my own um, head from the field work was a guy who um, lived, he had lived on his own. He had one room in a kind of a, a compound house in, um, in a kraal. He, um, he had a mobile phone like pretty much everyone. Um, and um, every morning he did the same thing. He um, flashed five people. Flashing is you know, I mean, the, the usual thing of um, making a phone call and you know, cutting off the connection before anyone picks up. So it was an absolutely costless way <laughs> of um, discharging a whole range of obligations. And the obligations were um, three um, cousins, female, um, basically niece, actually they were nieces. Um, kinship language is a little bit different, but anyway. Um, who had come from his home village and were now in boarding schools um, in Accra. Um, previously, he would have had to go visit them once a week to check after their moral welfare and all the rest of it. Um, now he could just flash them in the morning, okay? And he thought, you know, that's, that's the information revolution. That's great, okay? Um, literally saved himself a, a day a week. Um, but it, and the others were um, old school friends who are now in kind of good civil service jobs, and he wanted to make sure that he stayed in touch with them. They were now in the north, so he did the same. And again, you know, I mean, the, the flashing conveyed an awful lot of information. I'm here. I'm making contact. Here's our relationship, but with very little, um, you know, with little substance. Um, it stated in, you know, the the connection and the presence and all the rest of it. There's a lot of information there. Um, but cheap information. What I wanted to get at there is a um, there's a whole range of associations going on. Um, even taking this guy as an example, there are a whole range of associations. Um, the obligations are um, very clear and they're not negotiable. Okay, to kin, um, the sense of um, how one constructs a livelihood um, strategy. For example, the other flashes that he did to um, these business, these old school contacts. Um, it's non-negotiable. That sense of what connection and contact actually means and why you maintain them. What I meant by the virtualization there is that obviously they've been reduced to the flash again, a kind of contentless bit of information signaling, um, costless. And he 
just to follow that example, was really very economically rational. I mean, it's hard for an ethnographer to say this, but it was real, almost kind of, you know, um, formal economistic thinking. Um, this is where I can reduce the cost of relationship to zero. And, you know, this is pretty much how he talked about it. So the virtualization <coughs> of pre-existing relations and non-negotiable um, kinds of um, connections. Another couple of points I want to make about the mobile phones was that, um, again, calculation was very important. Um, and it came across in not just that kind of story, but also um, the fact that um, people were incredibly knowledgeable about the tiniest difference in tariffs and prices about phones. Um, there was also an enormous amount of employment, which was actually being created um, through um, mobile phones, the, the kiosks, the tables, the people, um, incredible kind of arbitrage, people making livings in the tiny differences of pricing between two different networks or different ways of making a phone call, all this sort of thing. Again, it's a kind of practical modality. It's about thinking through the nuts and bolts, the calculation of, um, of connection and what one can achieve through that kind of connection. Um, but what symbolizes an awful lot of this, um, do people know what this is? No? It's a coffin. At that time, you could get buried in, buried in your Nokia, OK? For all I know, you can now get buried in an iPhone. Um, what I love about this image is that in Ghana, um, the kind of the ultimate statement of connection and of all the kinds of patterns that I'm talking about um, was the funeral. Funerals were absolutely, you know, and these, I could, and any anthropologist of Ghana would bore you rigid with another hour about the nature of Ghanaian funerals, the kind of expenditure on them, all the rest of it, but they are phenomenal rituals of connection, okay? When, you, when I interview people in the, um, the biggest mobile phone company, I said, where are you going to put up your next masts? They said, well, we follow the funeral traffic. What? The funeral traffic meant where all the phone calls were made to actually assemble, to make these kinds of connections. Um, and this involves bringing people from you know, any number of different continents, places, all the rest of it, for three-day huge kind of um, events. Um, so being buried in your Nokia made an awful lot of sense. It wasn't just a silly joke. It also wasn't just a status symbol. It actually was a statement, I felt, about um, just what kind of con connectivity people were actually going on about in both symbolic and um, practical terms. Internet was completely opposite to that bore almost no relation to the kind of stuff I was just unfolding, uh, just elaborating. Um, to put it, again, in terms of, a, of, of just a, a snapshot kind of crystallization of what was going on, um, myself and um, several other researchers working together on interrelated projects um, across pretty much most of those 10 internet cafes over about 18 months, I think maybe two or three times we came across people who were using the internet in the way that, for example, the government understood you, what, what that might mean. Um, for example, going to a website <coughs> to get information. I mean, that was a very alien idea um, to this uh, the th absolutely huge popular culture of internet use um, there. The way, and it, uh, this always sounds a bit offensive, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. The way we, we described the whole team, um, internet use in um, this thriving popular culture, was the idea of collecting foreigners. Okay? Internet meant chat, and it meant going to, on to into very, you know, Yahoo or MSN or whatever at the time, um, to randomly approach anyone with a foreign sounding name and try to make connections there. If you will, the if mobile phone use was about the virtualization of, as it were, real and pre-existing relationships, ones that were seen as unarguable before whatever the form mediation, um, internet use was exactly the opposite. It was an attempt to, to take virtual relations, random 
people out there um, and turn them into real relationships. Um, and the real relationship was defined in terms of a whole range of things. Um, fundamentally, can I get an invitation to their country, a visa, an educational opportunity, marriage? Um, but sometimes also just can we have a longer conversation, one that goes you know, a little bit beyond high dead silence you know, and so on. So collecting foreigners was, did have the sense of, um, of building up lists, connections, conversations, um, which um, they try, you know, people were trying to make into real relationships. Again, a completely opposite kind of, um, of, of idea of what a relationship is. It also involved a completely different idea of calculation. Um, if the whole idea of mobile phone use was to reduce the cost of connection to something like zero, um, what we observed in internet use was people spending days and days and days in the mo what looked, you know, from the outside as a totally fruitless um, attempt to get forms of capital, which they never succeeded in getting. So in a sense, different sense of costlessness. People would invest without any thought to what what it was actually costing them. You could talk about that internet use in, if the other was a kind of mobile use of a kind of embedded, um, you know, in, in within, as I say, relationships deemed real before the mediation. Um, the internet use seemed to be about a kind of um, um, fantasy modality um, in which, yeah, it's about a kind of a world of possible goods out there that one could connect to. Um, in fact, what we tended to um, define it, uh, describe, characterize it in terms of was the idea of escape. And the reason it's defined in terms of escape is that the ultimate idea here um, fits into, again, a much wider modality. Um, a sense that um, a Ghanaian um, sociologist often talked about the internet as a kind of cargo cult. Goods come from the north. All goods come from the north. Um, there are even popular songs about all goods coming from the north. Internet was an almost magical way of, as in cargo cults, of bringing those goods to the Ghanaian shores. Um, I'm no doubt running out of time, so I'll just I'll, I'll kind of short circuit a bit of. What, one of the reasons I'm talking about modalities here, I mean, you know, one, one uh, <coughs> response would be, okay, well, they used internet and mobile phones in different ways. Um, what I, I hope I've, tri I've tried, what I've certainly tried to evoke is that it's more than that. Um, that internet, for example, um, that escape modality linked into um, other technologies and other media. Every, almost everyone I interviewed, particularly middle class Ghanaians, but not exclusively, they would say, oh, internet, it's just like pen pals when I was a kid. Um, there's also a twee word, um, the, one of the Ghanaian languages, um, for that kind of collecting foreigners, which I found out later, called Kamswa. Um, and for example, I had a guy telling me that when he was young, sort of 20, 30 years ago, before the internet, um, he would actually go to the point of, um, he wrote to the address that he found in a Gideon Bible. Okay because it was a foreign address. It was something to, to write to, um, to make that kind of connection. Um, Kamswa would also involve this kind of almost blank, what nowadays we would call spam, um, blanket kind of mailing, posting, um, to every educational institute you could find an address for um, in order to get an invitation um, to study or use or and so on. So on one hand, people related this to a broader set of media uses, if you will. Um, they also, um, again, this is not me, um, it's not some sort of hard one um, ethnographic finding, it's something that people said. Um, they said it was, was, it's very much like um, aid, isn't it? The internet is just like um, aid. And one reason why people, you know, we're trying to attract <laughs> flows of foreign funds, um, and, you know, the government does it in one way, and then we do it in another way. So, I mean, there were explicit kind of, you know, it's part of everyday language to talk about that, in, about the internet um, as a form of livelihood and development strategy, which was considered homologous with um, a whole history of 
um, of basically international aid. Mobile phones, if you want to use that kind of contrast, um, contrast in terms of that dimension, um, was talked about in completely different terms, um, as you might expect. Mobile <laughs> phones, were, in terms of livelihood strategy, related back, to, on the one hand, to kind of traditional strategies, you might say, um, kinship, social networks, building up those kinds of networks, and so on. Um, but by the same token, it was associated in most people's minds um, with a kind of populist neoliberalism. It was not donor dependency, it was not statist. It was about free self-organization. Um, and was also incredibly popular along those lines and also related to other kinds of media. Uh, mobile phones, for example, related to radio, which I said was very, very popular. So there are whole kinds of constellations of media, livelihood strategies, and so on, which were being built up and made sense of these different media and obviously made sense of their opposition to each other. But I wouldn't want to come to any very strict opposition, <coughs> formalize that opposition. I forgot I put this one in. Anyone want to, it's one of my little party tricks anyway. Um, anyone want to <laughs> hazard an interpretation of this? It relates to my sense of the mobile phone as related to popular neoliberalism or populist neoliberalism. Anyone have an idea what this might be? No? Okay. I, I, it, um, it was actually painted on a wall below, I've, I've got other images, um, a whole uh, basically list of um, phone numbers, um, which are the phone numbers of people who belong to what was called a base. This was Dallas base. Um, and it was a bunch of basically Muslim lads. Um, who were, they were a football club, they were a community aid kind of group, they were all kinds of stuff, but they were a base, a gang of guys. Um, and they were, I, just, you know, I could draw all kinds of connections to mobile phones, but it's this kind of modality one, this kind of structure of feeling. Um, Virgin Arts, who is a, did a lot of sign painting, this guy called Virgin Arts, um, said, I said, well, you know, what does this mean? And he said, well, we like Osama bin Laden and we like America. So I thought I'd put the two together. <laughs> okay? What, what, you know, I said, I, I don't think America and Osama like each other. Um, you know, what, what, where's the connection? What do you see? He said, well, basically, Osama is um, a, a good Muslim guy who's trying to do the best he can for his community. And America is a place of <laughs> entrepreneurship and um, in th in, in energy where people are trying to do the best for their community. So we kind of put those two together. And again, the structure of feeling was very, very close to the way people talked about mobile phones, their relationship to the community, and so on. Um, again, I, I could argue in more detail, but you know, there was, it seemed to speak to the structure of feeling. And it helped that it was actually below a whole string of phone numbers, but, um, which they connected to. I'm going to finish with one final point, which bring, comes, I mean, I, I hope you hear the political resonances of how media map onto, in, this, in that kind of story, can map onto ever wider kind of layers of, of political imagery and, and political sense. Um, if you move through this, these kinds of poetic leaps um, between different layers, um, the, the kind of structure of feeling I'm trying to map out. Um, but I would want to close with, um, as a word, the official. There, you know, I've told two stories, one about mobiles and one about internet. But there was another one, um, which probably brings us back to the um, that computer center that I started with. Um, the Ghanaian government very definitely did see one information revolution. Okay, and um, when I first arrived, um, I was basically presented with this pile of white papers, um, which had been written recently and more were written while I was there, um, which were every government department was writing these white papers about how Ghana would transform from an agricultural society to an information society, leaping over the industrial bit <coughs> um, by the year 2023, okay? Um, and basically every, you know, health, education, et cetera, et cetera. The modality for the government, of the government's um, their version of, of the media, of the transformation that was to be undergone, again, had nothing to do with either mobile or internet use, as I've just mapped them out. It just didn't connect. 
again, it connected um, to the kind of um, prestige global discourses of information. So, and again, they'd read their castells, so they knew what a network society was, and they were going to tell everyone. Um, again, um, you know, internet for, you know, to be really crude about it, was basically websites which gave a lot of information. Again, exactly the internet that was invisible to all the people that we interviewed. Um, and it's, if the modality of, of the mobile phone I've described as embedded in existing relations, um, internet as escape, ways of uh, either going to the north or attracting northern capital, um, I've described the um, Ghanaian, the government, the official version of these communicative assemblages um, as utilitarian or instrumental. Yeah, not sure. um, basically, um, there's no sense of relationship. If you, you know, on the one hand, I, you, know, you do the comparison with mobiles and internet. Um, rather, there are individuals um, who might be empowered to be either better consumers or better citizens through information access through. You know, it's a classic neoliberal kind of statement. Um, that um, the communicative assemblages are um, about um, the rational pursuit of previously defined interests of individuals rather than about the kinds of relationships which they're forming, which is what all the popular cultures of phone and internet was about. Um, it had all the exclusionary character that I tried to identify through the computer center in the first place. Again, I mean, uh, ministers were shocked every time I or any of my, the researchers I worked with pointed out to them what was happening on the high street. Um, Ghana was meant to be a place where there was no internet going on um, unless it was what was visible through this modality. Um, phone was slightly different. Um, they recognized and they appreciated the fact that it was this kind of explosive commercial activity but it didn't actually have an awful lot to do with um, information society at that change later, at that time, in my view. Um, and the final point I'd want to make here is that um, <coughs> it's not just that um, from the point of view of that modality, um, okay, it strings together different kinds of objects, different relationships, different models, different political um, structures, and the rest of it. Um, but the other thing, obviously, is simply that, um, you know, and it also doesn't see what's happening in anyone else's world. Um, and the final point is that it obviously doesn't see itself as a narrative or as a modality at all. It's simply, this is the way things are. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's again, hardly a, a surprising result, but it's, it's one that dominated um, the way in which these different communicative possibilities unfolded. Um, that from the point of view of the official discourses, um, yeah, I mean, they, it was simply, um, they weren't, um, as it were, symmetrical. They, the, the official discourse was not on the same level as the other two. Um, it was in a different world. Didn't recognize the other world. Also didn't recognize itself as a version um, of what's going on. At which point I think I would come back to where I started, which is the role of the very idea of media in organizing a political field. The government could do that because um, for one thing, for, I mean, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that um, it could start with a prestige international idea of media. Um, there's something called the internet which has certain kinds of properties. It's the job of development, people, specialists, whatever, academic or um, NGO or whatever, um, to ensure that that media this thing we know about unfolds in the best possible way in any particular circumstance. It's a very specific way of seeing what communication might be all about and how to organize it. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We have about um, 15 minutes or so for questions. If Can I go on that font? more an observation maybe that I would appreciate your view on is that maybe your your 
uh, case study shows a, a step backwards from assemblage or actor network theory and more is more closely aligned to a kind of social construction of technology approach in that you're looking at uh, something which is supposedly universal, this Castellian universal model, and, and does that actually exist anywhere apart from in the mind of Manuel Castells? Yeah. And in, in some ways, it, what, is, what is obdurate about the internet in, in any of the, if, if, you know, if you were to do a ethnography within Oxford University or, or wherever, so I, I don't know whether Scott is a useful analytic to, to mm. kind of approach this to kind of step backwards maybe from chronologically in, in terms of actor network theory to social construction technology. Okay. It's been a bit of a long day, but uh, um, I'm not sure why this is social constructionist. Um, that's certainly not my intention mm -hmm. here. Um, I just don't want it to be materially reductionist. Mm -hmm. it, it's as simple as that. If anything, what I've been exploring, um, which I, I mean, just didn't have time for that bit, but um, I refer to the kind of Bateson, Strother, and Riles argument, which is, um, I don't see, it's not social constructionist, it's about information theory. Mm -hmm. um, one way I've been playing around with opposing what I've been trying to talk here about the limitations of AMT, if you will, I'm not sure the language works yet, is what I'm playing around with. Um, in information theory, there's that distinction between the syntactic and the semantic. And AMT is great on the syntactic, how things connect up, how things might be seen as um, kind of um, sent organized. You know, um, but what it misses is the semantic, <laughs> actually. Um, and that's what I'm trying to get at with the idea of modalities. Um, you know, um, that, the, that the actual content, the meaningful content of those connections is actually also part of their structure. Um, but I would if I've got you right, I mean, I'm trying, I would want to do that through information theory. Mm -hmm. I certainly want, don't want to go back to a kind of social constructionism. Okay. Um, I think it's also, you know, again, it's hard in these kinds of talks, but it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, for example, um, the Castellian, you know, how that comes into the Ghanaian government in 2003 to 5. Um, no, it's, it's not so much social shaping, it's, it's more performativity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that this stuff really organized the way people did stuff, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not a lot was being fed back upwards. And that's not just because of a certain set system of classifications or because of the way Castell's thought, but because of the function that he played in international flows from, you know, from the states downwards, basically. Is that? Yeah. 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 I mean, just, if I may, just a slight yeah. continuation of the information theory point. Another thing that was kind of flashed up in my mind was the way the principle of entropy is used in informational theory, and I think that kind of came across very clearly in your Okay. Case studies. Can you tell me how? I'm, I'm really bad at this. I'm new to it. Uh, as, as far as I understand how entropy is used in informational theory, uh, it relates to cybernetics. I don't know if anyone yeah. uh, knows more about this than me. And it's the idea that uh, information has a certain, uh, like energy, it has a certain period in which it's useful. And then it, in certain contexts, it becomes less useful and dissipates. So, and, and there's certain situations in, in the case you presented, the, the government funded uh, internet cafe in which the potential energy or use yeah. of access to the internet just dissipates. Just, just yeah. dissipates and, and so it's I mean, certainly one thing that I get out of, uh, one way I might characterize what I, you know, what I, the material I was working with there was that, um, like that's that ca that um, computer center has the appearance of very tightly organized, mm. um, and part of its own fictional version of itself is that it's a coherent, structurally coherent kind of entity, but it isn't. <laughs> it doesn't actually connect anything. So that kind of dissipation of energy. Yeah, the guy who I mean the guy who was running it was fantastic, mm. really creative, energetic, all the rest of it. Deeply frustrated. Um, because he could see it wasn't going anywhere. Um, and yet it was very impossible for him to argue against the structure of it. You know, it, it had all kinds of mandates, you know, internationally, locally, 
logically, in a sense, it seemed like coherent whole, partly because these objects, these machines, look like self-evident objects. Um, right down to the, you know, the, the structure of that cafe, you know, it's like, yes, individuals sit in front of machines, and then and they have access to keyboards, and that's how it works, it's it. So yeah, entropy, I, I think, possibly some of yeah. it is that sense of that, that, that tension between um, you know, entropy as, as kind of, or let, <coughs> rather, organized, structured information, which then becomes unstructured in various ways. I say I'm really, it's, I'm very new to this stuff, so I'm not, yeah. Are you mentioning? Sorry, you were actually first. I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's just Thanks. real, yeah. Um, partially linked to the last, I mean, the last point you said. <coughs> so your closing statement was um, that it's kind of the role of development practitioners, in a way, um, to make sure that technologies or these kinds of things um, unfold in the most appropriate way. And then I just, so it made me wonder, what, how was your research linked um, to your first case study? You mentioned it was a different funded project. And has your research been used? Because yeah. actually it's just so common that those kind of mistakes are made because of this kind of top-down approach. Yeah. Um, and there is, I mean, there is a lot of learning and best practice and much more participation and um, better um, um, kind of needs assessment type things that do happen in kind of more business case approaches happening now compared to yeah. back in 2003 but it, there are still mistakes like this and how do you prevent <coughs> or how, how first of all how has your research been taken and okay. have you seen it being used and then also how do you if we can say okay fine that for internet and mobile phones we can take this learning but then if an, another technology or another material thing comes out in a completely different context, maybe not related to communication, yeah. but how do you then not make the same mistakes again? Yeah. Um, I mean, two media responses. One is, I think mistakes is a very generous way of putting it. <laughs> okay, I don't think it's about mistakes. Um, the other thing is just, it's, I mean, it's a monumentally complicated question that you're asking. And I've, I mean, I was actually thinking, there's another couple of chapters in the book which are almost specifically about that, and I was thinking I might do those instead. But. Um, What's a simple, what's a, I mean, a quick, you know, kind of brief response but is... Well, your research, uh, yeah. as a, pa like, packagely given to differed and made to learn, except they to learn from them. Very, very patchy. I mean, the, um, the first really, it's, I, I, I did a work in Trinidad, which was not development-oriented at all, so that, I'll leave that out. Next one was um, two projects with UNESCO. One was in Sri Lanka, and then through the same guy who funded, or who organized that. Um, I was involved in a program with um, eight, it depends on the count, but basically eight um, ICT innovation projects around South Asia. That was the best thing I've ever been involved in because it was construed, it was actually defined from the beginning as learning experience. Not as, let's implement a project and then monitor and evaluate it. But let's actually say, what can we find out? And let's fund projects which are designed to experiment with different bits of the kind of communicative landscape. Um, with this particular focus, probably because of the UNESCO guy who, who put it together, on um, relations between new and old media. So it, it had something to do with convergence built in from the beginning and assemblage. Um, the second thing about that project was that um, the guy, we convinced him um, to put a full time researcher with ethnographic training in each of those projects. And we wrote a kind of manual which committed each of those projects for that researcher not just to be kind of researching on the side, but to be part of the core project team. Okay, so that, it, again, to un underwrite the sense of, of a learning, you know, the thing is a learning project, not, mm -hmm. a, a, kind of, not a development implementation. Um, it was wonderful for about two years until UNESCO pulled a plug on it. Basically, a management consultant in Norway said, but where are the generalizable findings, where are the indicators, blah, blah, blah. Um, I could get very bitter about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was wonderful. You know, and that certainly provided a model which, other, which people <coughs> have been doing some work with in other places. Um, one of the problems with development, I found, with this kind of work is simply the world is full of pilot projects which never get anywhere. So everyone's trying to do, you know, little bits of, of work, and then 
then someone else starts off on another strain, train of thought. Um, I th yeah, I mean, the deeper issue is simply that, um, I don't know, I mean, I think we need a, a, a almost anarchist sort of um, opportunism, you know, finding the cracks in various systems where you can actually do something a little bit more adventurous, and which is not constrained. And this, this is where I come back to, I think, mistakes is, is a very <coughs> Um, generous interpretation of what's going on. Um, you know, the, the, um, the forms of knowledge and practice around communication are incredibly rigid in, in the development world. Um, every time I try to do any of this stuff, or anyone I know, uh, they're up against, you know, monitoring evaluation models, communicative, you know, stuff from communications theory and media studies which go back to the 50s, but somehow, you know, still kind of structure UNESCO work. Bizarre stuff, um, but a lot of that again goes back to the question. You know, basically the reason I'm saying this is you're being generous. Um, people in UNESCO or DFID have huge empires of media intervention projects to manage, and they need tight definitions of media, and uh, and to claim to know what the properties of media are. That's what I was saying at the end, um, and then to to reduce the role of both researchers and of project imp implementation to finding the optimal con con conditions under which to unfold those known properties. If you start from the other point of view that I don't know what the hell this stuff does, mm -hmm. but I'd be really interested to see what people do with it. <laughs> That's a little bit threatening, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. to put it, not to put too fine a point on it. I say there was this one project <coughs> where they took that attitude. Um, I would love to, if, this, if the internet is the answer, what was the question? It was the, 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 the kind of slogan <laughs> of the project. That was great. Um, and they stuck to that as well. I've got to give everyone credit for that. Yeah, so. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'm sort of interested um, in the sort of relationship people have with the material aspects of these sort of um, ICT interventions. So the picture of the internet cafe I found really interesting because it seemed like this really kind of clean, neat space with all the computers sort of ordered in this very particular manner, and it kind of represented a space that was sort of uh, marked as very outside of the kind of chaotic uh, part of the... Well, just a sociable yeah. structure of most spaces. Yeah. yeah. It was so a very different sort of spaces. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just wondering if perhaps, like, maybe this kind of, the way in which the, the space looks sort of helped to legitimize the idea of this kind of intervention, like, sort of... Yeah, I mean, it's actually crucial. it represented, crucial. or... Yeah, it was crucial, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, if you remember the slide, well, the original slide, um, I didn't talk about this, but that's the government center, and that's just a, an internet cafe in the area we we're working in, in Mamobi. And they're not particularly different, okay? <laughs> it's also where I'd say, you know, how much do you lay on the, on the material? Yes, I mean, you're, in one sense, you're absolutely right. Um, and that's, and particularly in that rural environment, um, that was a, both a modern and a western space, okay? Individualized, these are cubicles where people sit individually in front of a computer. Um, one of the differences between that space and that space is that in the, part of because of the constraints on it and its official status, mm -hmm. people did actually sit individually in front of computers unless they were part of a, a, a school class, in which case they didn't go anywhere near the computer. They were just kind of in a circle around it. In that one, with the same kind of physical configuration, um, it's commercial space, <coughs> and part of, as I say, kind of popular culture of internet on the street there. Um, it's organized in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and that's really a poor photo. Yeah. Um, normally, there'd be just a gaggle of people around and <laughs> girls, you know, kind of screaming at the computer and, you know, etc. Um, you know, have, so it was a more complicated picture than that. Mm -hmm. The legitimation function of the of that material configuration was more crucial here. Okay. Um, Why so exactly? Because it was an official project where the CEO of the district was saying, Literally, I have captured this debt cancellation money to bring modernity to Karabo. Um, and we're going to do it in a, in a sense, you know, following best practice. And best practice is Western individualizing use of that computer. So it's one person per keyboard kind of thing. 
and that yeah that was part of the structure of the whole place just to if so yeah. if this sort of aesthetic appeal of sort of a, um, it appealed to the sort of policymakers and the bureaucrats in that sense I would say more than appealed is the only way you could imagine right. but that this is appropriate use of, a, right. of the technology but how about to the people who were supposed to be using these spaces what was that relationship uh, between the well again in this one um, they pretty much followed the rules um, partly again because you know access was was much more strictly mm -hmm. um, um, policed um, anyone could do whatever the hell they wanted partly in the commercial ones also partly because the um, the owners all, except for one e exception um, knew absolutely nothing about the technology they were just there as entrepreneurs who were you know, funding this stuff mm -hmm. um, so they didn't care what anyone machines um, and the uh, staff tended to be just really overworked and not paying much attention either whereas here things were in the um, the official one things were pretty tightly policed and there was much more of a sense of I mean the other thing is I didn't mention um, that room is in the actual um, town hall okay it was actually in an official building so the, the whole thing had a much more yeah, I mean, a much more coherent picture of legitimizing a Western use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, I say the guys who used it most were these three bank employees, so they already had the sense of, you know, what it, what it means to work in an office, okay, which would not be um, you know, available to anyone else who was using it. Um, so they used it appropriately. So um, all I'm saying is, yeah, I mean, basically you're right, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's a complicated story, you know. Um, I couldn't lay it all on just you know, the fact that the yeah, cubicles are laid out. In particular. The other thing that you know was really important about this space was that you know what was available and what wasn't. Uh, they taken out the microphones and the um, speakers. Um, the printer had never been taken out of its box, so that, you know <coughs> these were made into absolutely standalone things. You know, the material material configuration was not just about the cubicles; it was every aspect of how that machine was seen. So it did connect through a fantastic, at the time, ISDN line. But otherwise, you know, it was just, I was thinking of the man with two brains, just a brain and a bat. You know, it was kind of, it was kind of not connecting to anything. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm just curious about, based on you know, a lot of the experience of the field work, so did so you the, uh, field work in, in different countries, different yeah. places. Did you find there are some repeated patterns um, for of the distribution of the tech information technologies in the internet, for example? Because yeah, such kind of the things also happens in. China what do you mean by sorry? No. <laughs> so the same things. What? Yeah, the, like the coffee bar or something. Internet cafe. Yeah, such kind of the things happens in China before, and uh, your stories you just talked about, mm. I, I can imagine, you know, associate with uh, some stories in China mm. as well. So I'm just curious about, curious about, it might be happens in different Asian countries as well. So did you find any repeated patterns, <coughs> repeated patterns of the diffusion of technologies? So I find that an almost impossible question to answer. And I, 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 you know, I mean, um, and partly, you know, again, coming from an ethnographic perspective, I'm almost constitutionally incapable of doing that kind of thing um, and don't want to. Okay. Um, comparative stuff I find really interesting. Um, um, yeah, it depends which story to tell. Um, what, 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 what interests me more, okay, if you take the example of the Internet Cafe, um, you can have the same structure. Um, with completely different kinds of activities and social relations around it, oh, completely yeah, different course. meaning, all the yeah. rest of it. And I, I suppose I'm more interested in the difference than I am in the sameness, mm. um, to be, be quite honest. Um, I mean, to give one example, the um, if you compare, compare, it's not an Asian example, but um, in Trinidad, um, people's use of also um, extensive use of chat, but there's very little use by young people. It's very different for older people. Um, very different patterns of use, which I didn't get in Ghana. Um, use of, of um, chat was, I think, there was almost none of that kind of um, collecting of foreigners. Um, you know, their sense of what chat meant, what you do with it. Um, one of the things, I mean, the, the book that Daniel Miller and I did on the internet in, in Trinidad, um, 
if Ghanaians were using chat almost exclusively and they were um, for internet use, they're and using it almost exclusively in what I call this escape mode of trying to connect to the north. Um, Trinidadians had a completely different view of why they were doing all this chatting. Um, the thing that we're most, you know, coming across was, well, Trinidadians went on to uh, um, chat forums in order to be more Trinidadian, not to get out of Trinidad. Um, we did a lot of uh, discussion about um, Trinidadians loved um, chat for what they, um, and the local word was liming. Um, it's basically you, st you stand at a street corner and you engage in a lot of banter. You just sat, stand and chat. A lot of it is, you know, heavy sexual innuendo and wordplay and all the rest of it. It's seen as kind of definitively Trinidadian by a lot of Trinidadians. Um, what people said was, you know, chat, online chat is fantastic because we can hang out. I'm in Canada, he's in London, she's in Port of Spain, and we can line. Okay? Now, again, you know, the point here is that it, it's just... What sense do, what do we want to make of it? Yes, everyone chats, particularly young people chat. You know, but why do they do it in utterly opposite ways? Yeah. So with, maybe, maybe we should bring things to a close now um, and evacuate this room. Um, <laughs> These are going to be turfed out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But let, let me, uh, before we leave, let me say a few things. One, um, we are going for drinks in the King's Arms, and you're all welcome to join if you want to find. Um, and we can just say thank you all the time for coming up here and giving this talk. Thank you, guys. Thank you.